Okay, so let me let me begin. The aims of my talk, uh, several aims. First, to realize how creativity is deeply intertwined with the very fabric of our society. Uh, I'm going to start not because uh, I mean, okay. You read my abstract and it, and it cites the Robinson Report, which is a UK Commission report that was released in 1999. It's not because I have a British accent that I'm picking on this report. I became a US citizen in December last year. But the reason why I'm using this report is that I don't think we have a report like this in the US. And it's been almost, it's over 10 years since we had this report. Uh, and I, I want us to look very carefully at this to set the scene of, of do we still have the same problems and challenges that was reported back in the UK uh, over 10 years ago? Okay? And my, my claim is that we do, uh, and, and, it's, and it's not just an issue for schools, but it's an issue for us and our society. Secondly, um, education and the economy are deep concerns. You'll hear very, several themes around the economy in my talk. And it's not just about education and productivity and issues of national security. It's about issues about will, desire, happiness, freedom, all these very emotional but also very uh, important democratic themes. Uh, that's, I'm trying to tend to that. I also aim to explain how creativity is not just a product, but a process. In many times, creativity uh, it lies in the eye of the beholder. You know, what, I believe that painting is a very creative thing. It's very, it's very judgmental. It's very evaluative. But I, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an East-West civilization contrast that it isn't just about a product, but it is a process as well. And, and hopefully by the end of my talk, I'll actually answer my question: uh, How is creativity in schools? I'll give you an answer to that question. Um, and, and I'm going to say that it is in, in our schools. It is embedded in our schools, our educational system. Uh, it's just not that visible, is my claim. Uh, and finally, I'm going to call for action that we really need to rethink education. And most importantly, if there's anything, one thing we take away from this talk, it's time to talk to our children. It's time to ask them about education. I just don't think we're doing that enough. And yes, I'm in a higher education institution, but these children grow up and they come here to UMass Dartmouth and go to higher education. Okay, so it is, it, it is part of us as K-12 and partnering with higher education to think about these issues. There are my aims. First of all, I'm going to talk about do schools kill creativity. I'm going to give you an overview of the Robinson Report, so it's pretty uh, factual and definition. I'm going to build on that report and give you my reflections on what creativity is and how it helped me establish a research program. And then I'm going to give you some remarks from my own work, the work of my colleagues and I over 10 years, and some of the results that we've found in the context of mathematics education. Let me start with, do schools, do schools kill creativity? This was an interview with uh, Sir Ken Robinson, who was the lead, was the chair of the, uh, the committee that I'm referring to in the Robinson Report back in 98 and published in 99. Uh, he now lives in uh, America. And there was an interview with Sir Ken on, in Education Today just last year. Here's his, here's his response to do, skills, do schools really kill creativity? One of the problems is that the organization of education in most countries has developed to meet the needs of an industrial economy. And that's simply not suited to the 21st century. I think that's a profound statement. We educate people in a very linear way. The whole assumption is based on a 1950s model whereby children have to be processed in an orderly fashion through the curriculum and eventually go to university, get a good degree, and then they'll get a job for life. That's what we tell our children. Okay. So here's one of these children. Okay. This is Luca. He belongs to me. He just turned six, and he started kindergarten at Quinn Elementary, just down the road. <laughs> Luca will retire in 2017, I hope. What would his world look like then? And are we educating him and all the other little boys and girls who just entered school this year for the future. So I came here in 2000, 
Jim Catherine gave me this computer, the G3 Lombard. It was the first Apple I'd ever used. It was heavy, but it was awesome. And there were other things lying around the office that looked quite strange and are now uh, historical items. And it ran at an amazing 233 megabits. <laughs> And we're in 2010, 10 years later, I have the great next to show. And now my computer can balance on a thumb. Some people are very impressed with what they've helped uh, enter into our, into our world. And they're very, very fast. And there are other amazing devices, which is also telling me when I should stop talking, um, that, that, we, that I now use. 10 years, that's not a long time. Uh, technology has, has transformed how I do business and how I work and how I interact today in 10 years. What's my point? We don't know what Luca's world is going to look like in, in, in 2017. We have no idea. And futurists might have some say. I might have some say. We have absolutely no clue what's going to, what our schools are going to look like in a few years' time. Let alone 60. Okay. Well, what do we have? Okay. Luca has an iPhone. Well, he doesn't, but he wants one. Luca has an iPhone. Okay. He has the affordances of an iPhone or an iTouch or a device that can give him access to the world. Okay. It's called a global education. He has it in his fingertips now. So my claim is his identity now, this is at the heart of my talk about uh, what is creativity. His identity is projected into the world now, not just local. He can see things and be part of things that were just not, that were invisible before. Okay. He positions himself now relative to this world. But finally, and this is for me the, the crux of it all, he defines himself, his creativity, and his education, not your education, his education. Okay. So, we hear a lot about how technology, like it's something out there, given to us. We haven't demanded, of course, anything. I mean, Steve Jobs just dreamt this up. He never asked it. Yeah, okay, he doesn't have uh, focus groups, but he knows what we want. And he's done a very good job at supplying it to us. We demand this technology. We want to communicate. We want to be educated through awesome devices. Okay. So this has impacts on the economy. And we hear a lot about now this social economy of ideas, not just the financial economy, the social economy, social networks, how we, how we can talk and interact with people at great distances that we can be legitimately uh, on the periphery, periphery participating through Skype, through a lot of online uh, uh, tools, and, 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 there is a, and can invest in a social economy of ideas. Inside the classroom this exists as well. So our communication infrastructures have begun to be transformed by technology. And my claim is that we can begin to rethink curriculum at a very deep epistemological level and understand from history how in history epistemological ruptures have transformed how we do business, how we think, how we interact, and how we evolve as human beings. In the history of mathematics, if it wasn't for a few mathematicians who said no, they disagree with some basic fundamental ideas from Euclid, we wouldn't have had the theory of relativity. We wouldn't have seen modern discoveries in science today. People have to say, no, I disagree, to see change, to see advancement of science. OK, so that's just an introduction to uh, hopefully framing some of the ideas I'm going to present tonight. Let me now turn to the Robinson Report and give you a brief overview uh, I don't want to be too technical, but I want to, I've, I've extracted what I think a uh, very interesting point. The, the report is online, it's also on the website for this talk. And I'm, when you see numbers in my slides, that refers to paragraph numbers. It's a white paper, so each paragraph gets a number. And so you can see the context when we go back later on and see uh, where, this, uh, where, I'm, where I'm pulling these uh, paragraphs from. Okay. 